Greetings and salutations, particularly to all MHS grads. Uh, this is Mick Rizzo. Honored to have our good buddy, everybody's Goomba, uh, Wild Bill Cycli, on the on the phone with me for today. Candidly, I was dazed and confused, as most everybody was, when I started getting this stuff on the new changes on my automobile policy. And so I thought, who could I talk to about this and get uh, a true lay of the land and just uh, somebody who's... Uh, comments and insight I would value, and um, everybody who ever went to, to Madison or any of the district schools knows that Bill's a, a, a graduate of the Madison School District, MHS Class of 70, a graduate of James Madison College at MSU, did undergraduate work, was a teacher for about five years, got his master's degree, got the calling, returned back to Detroit to uh, go to uh, U of D School of Law. Worked full-time, graduated top of the class, committed to personal injury, uh, expanded to other areas of uh, practice, represented small businesses and multinational companies, been active with the Southfield School Board, volunteered a lot of time to Madison, and just an all-around great guy. Thank you, Bill, for taking a minute and uh, helping us uh, at the uh, MHS websites. Does that work for you? Well, yeah. thank you, Mike. Uh, Mick, that is uh, certainly a, a kind and wonderful introduction I appreciate that thank you but from this point on you got to call me mick man i mean everybody's I will. Gonna think I'm, I will. <laughs> I'm kidding that uh, so billy the, what i read today is that uh and you know i'll, I'll be honest with you i, I kind of sort of knew this stuff but nothing too technical uh michigan drivers are required by law to have no fault automobile insurance that includes pip personal sure. injury protection Several other states in the U.S. have no-fault requirements, but ours is unique in that PIP coverage provides for unlimited medical benefits for the lifetime of the injured person when those injuries exceed uh, or occur from an auto accident. So it, it, humor me for a second, Billy, and is that the crux of what this is all about? That, uh, that... Sure, sure. Listen, when, when this was done, and I believe that the no-fault act was passed in 1977 or 78. I was in law school at the time, um, and it, it, it was, was and to this day is, considered the Cadillac of all automobile plans. And the idea was that we would get rid of the, uh, the typical lawsuit, what we call a third-party claim, suing somebody for running that stop sign that injured you, unless your injury met a particular threshold. And in exchange for that, what you got was no fault medical coverage. It didn't matter whose fault the accident was. If you got injured, you got medical care. And this was the gold standard. You got all your medical care. You got all your attendant care. You got what modifications needed to be done to your home. If you were seriously injured in an automobile accident, then, then you were taken care of. And you did not end up on the public bill. You didn't end up on Medicaid. You didn't end up in a nursing home unless you chose or your family chose that for your care. It made it possible for these people to live with some dignity. Uh, and and that's, what it's, that's what it's about. It says, what it was about until now. It says that... Um... Today, as a result, that Michigan has the fourth most expensive auto insurance in the country, and we're also ranked fourth in the U.S. with about 20% of our drivers uninsured. Correct. Uh, it, 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 the, the problem is that the premiums that the insurance companies charge, remember insurance companies' number one goal is not to provide you with coverage. It's to make their profit. You know, that's the business that they are in. Uh, I'm not making any value judgments about that. But as a result, the, when you have a combination of skyrocketing medical cost and unlimited coverage, the insurance companies have increased and increased and increased their uh, payments. So one of the many things that this uh, this new legislation does is change it, it changes not only what kind of coverage you have to have, but it gives the insurance companies more control over how much they must pay for that coverage. All you had to do in the past was show that it was reasonable and necessary. 
now they have all kinds of changes in terms of managed care options, and that's why this is going to be so complicated for people who are picking, because they not only have to pick the level of coverage, but then what other kinds of attendant coverage they're going to get. Are you going to have, are you going to take an option to um, have uh, other coordinated benefits for uh, for everything, almost everything that, that is in it? Are you going to have to choose to have uh, them control, the, the insurance company control who you get medical care from? That will reduce, could reduce your premium some. You, are you going to choose to have attendant care if you need it? That will reduce your premium if you don't take it. So the big issue is going to be how much risk does a person want to take on? Because if you have a serious accident, you've represented plenty of paraplegics and quadriplegics as a result of auto accidents. If you, and you have a two hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand dollar coverage, you will blow through that in about six months. Hmm. Even even if you have great health insurance coverage or you have Medicare, the cost of modifying your home, the cost of the attendant care, the cost of the rehabilitation centers that you have to go to, are such that two hundred fifty thousand dollars would not be uncommon in just a few months. Certainly $500,000 in the first year is not an uncommon amount of money. It, Fortunately enough, we don't have a lot of quadriplegics in car accidents as a result of car accidents anymore. Cars have improved. Sure. So it's a risk-benefit analysis that each of us are going to have to make. So as I look at my policy, because I printed, uh, I printed it off for this conversation, uh, and I tried to wade through with the... Um, AARP Hartford Insurance people, and right. and <laughs> was was like really close to the vest when I'm trying to understand. So, based on our conversation, what little studying I've done, the PIP, the personal injury protection, which as I look at my premium here, I see out of uh, sixteen hundred dollars on my car, uh, nine hundred and sixty five dollars is uh, on the PIP right now, which is unlimited. Uh, I'm doing 100,000 and 300,000 on my bodily injury liability, 100,000 on property damage. Um, and uninsured, I don't know if this is redundant, but 100,300 um, on motorist bodily damage and uh, Un- uninsured, uninsured and uninsured. Right, right, right. Right. So it's not, that's not redundant. Um, I, I really, I have very strong feelings about making sure that you have underinsured, uninsured coverage. Cool. If you get hit by someone and you're in a serious accident and they've got either no insurance or $20,000 worth of coverage, you want to make sure that you can go to your uh, insurance company and say, I want the difference between that and the $100,000 underinsured policy that I have or uninsured policy that I have. What what happens in that situation is you collect it from your insurance company rather than going against the other person. Hmm. What you have to do, you still have to show fault. But if you've got a, somebody who hits you and they're at fault and they are underinsured, that's a protection for you. Sure. Um, what does this, in general, what does this mean to uh, the majority of us MHS people that are sure. Linked in together our um, our seniors or approaching senior status. Uh, what does well, that mean for senior car owners? So, so let, let's break this down in a couple different ways. First of all, how much liability insurance do you have to have? One of the things that most many of us miss is as we get older and we get near retirement, we actually have more assets than we think we do. It's not uncommon for um for somebody who has worked in a factory, just by way of example, all their life, and they've saved and they've got their retirement benefits to actually be worth a million dollars or close to a million dollars in assets. And if you have a limited amount of liability coverage and you get into an accident that you're at fault in, then you could really lose almost everything that you have 
for not because you don't have enough insurance. So that's one thing I suggest people take a look at. The, but the other is how much how much risk am I willing to tolerate? And I suggest people look at things like, okay, what's my Medicare coverage really like? Medicare covers 80% Part A uh, uh, for your health insurance. You've still got to pay the other 20%. Now, you can do that with a Medicare gap policy. Mm-hmm. or But if you don't have that, it's going to come out of whatever you pick as your personal and personal uh, your PIP benefits. So where, where does that leave us, Nick? If you have Medicare and it covers 80% and you're a paraplegic or quadriplegic or you lose your legs or use of your legs, lose an arm, the medical bills will be such that you will still probably go through a couple hundred thousand dollars. And the question is, am I willing to risk that? Sure. What happens what happens if you don't have enough coverage? You end up usually on both Medicare and then you end up on Medicaid as well. And, and the public will have to pay for that differential. Sure. So um, many of us have uh, the Medicare supplements, uh, I would say a, a, a pretty good percentage do. I hope so. Yeah. I, I certainly hope so, Mick. You're absolutely right. People ought to have a, a Medicare supplement. Um, you, you do have to you, you do have to be careful, though. Uh, one of the problems with buying Medicare supplements is that 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 company ends up running your Medicare program. And I, I just went through this with a client the other day. Uh, he was in a nursing home. He got COVID and uh, Blue Cross. He had a Blue Cross uh, supplemental plan, and they discharged, demanded that he be, be discharged from the nursing home, even though he tested positive for COVID. And I was told that Medicare would never have done such a thing. Hmm. But because Blue Cross makes its money by controlling the cost that they end up paying for you because he was asymptomatic and but tested positive for COVID, they still released him. Hmm. By refusing to pay for his coverage, so you, you, you do need to be careful and look at those plans carefully um, in terms of who you are looking at. I always recommend to people that they look at AARP um, endorsed policies for sure. that reason. And that that does make sense. My my supplement is a is an AARP, as is now the, the Hartford the, the insurance. I took a look at it. And it's, uh, you know, you, you have to do a little bit of homework, but it's uh, it's been an asset in, in both cases for me, and I feel comfortable. How does somebody review their policy? And, uh, I mean, it's it's almost uh, pig Latin. Um, <laughs> I will tell you, I, I'm disappointed to tell you, Mick, that too many lawyers don't know how to review their policy. Hmm. Um, it, first of all, it, it, it's written um, for lawyers, not for uh, and for insurance agents, not for uh, the average person. I, I do wish that we would adopt plain language requirements for insurance policies, but we haven't in this state. And they add new exceptions every year. Uh, you get a statement adding new declar what they call declarations. You never read them. Hell, I don't read them if I'm honest about it, uh, unless I'm reading them in the law journals. Um, and they, there will be some case that comes out that talks about whether or not an insurance policy must cover this, that, or the other thing, and they will write an exclusion for that purpose. Um, and and unfortunately. Um, you know, they're, they're in the business to make money. So they will do what they can to limit their exposure. Not, not an uncommon or unrealistic or unexpected, um, phenomenon. But so I suggest that the first thing you do, I like the way you put it, Mick, you said, um, you, you know, you went first to AARP. The reason I recommend AARP endorsed policy is the first level of research was done by AARP. They hire professionals to, to go over the policies carefully to figure out how does this advantage our membership. And so they pick those policies. So that's the first level. Second level uh, I would recommend is that you sit down and 
read the policy the, the best you can, take notes, and then go to your agent with those notes and ask very specific questions and get their answers and write them down. Hmm. That way, if something turns out wrong, you, you have another claim because insurance agents are obligated to answer your questions correctly. And if, if you do this and online, go ahead and excuse me, if you do this yep. online um, and, and you work through the Hartford, you're going to wind up online or in a, in a telephone conference. Mm-hmm. It's not like the, in the old days where your, your mom and dad's uh, insurance <laughs> agent became your insurance Change. agent. Um, you probably or came went to, to the house. Yeah, eh? and yeah. Uh, you grew up with the uh, same kids. May maybe even went to Madison or to to St. Vincent's or St. Mary Magdalene or whatever. Right. In other words, there were there were those personal contacts, those touch points. In addition, uh, that's kind of different now. So um, I guess one of my questions would be: How do you value or how do you keep in perspective? You know what that agent who's reading off a cue card from a monitor uh, when you're on the phone with them. How, how do you? Uh, how can you uh, see the value in that or keep a perspective right. on what they're right. what they're telling you? Well, um, yes, great questions, Mick. The, the the very first thing that I tell people is, you know, uh, if you're technologically competent, I urge people to do it online. The reason I urge it is that you can cut and paste those. You get to save those questions and answers, right? Right. And you can't do that necessarily on a phone call unless you choose to record it or they've recorded it. And so I suggest people do it online. They type out the questions. They get an answer back. They cut and paste it into a document and hang on to it. Um, You know, it's tough. One of the benefits of personal relationships is that we trusted those people. And, you know, that trust was usually built up over a period of time. You don't know who you're dealing with on the other side now. And you're right. They're probably reading off a cue card. That's why you ought to save the, the answer. Right. And at um, the very least, I would think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Billy, but who everybody has coverage right now, or at least they should. Um, before this kicks into July 1, and there's no guarantee, it just means that beginning July 1, when your policy next comes up for renewal, uh, you know, the old, <laughs> the old sleight of hand is going to begin to take place. But the point I'm making yeah. is hard copy, yeah, your, hard copy your coverage right now so you can see what the bodily injury is, what, you know, what the personal property is, and have that with you in hand so you know what you're paying for now. And when the new and improved is coming down the line, you you at least can, in some way, shape, or form, and this could be apples and oranges, but it's got to come close to being able to line up with what you have today and what they expect from you in the future. Is okay, that... Mick, here's the first time I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. Um, because here's what they're going to sell. Here's what they're already selling. You're get, going to get to buy what you choose. They're going to talk about this as freedom of choice. You can save as much money as you choose by buying what you want or need. Now, what do most of us, when we get to the point of retirement, what do we do? We try to save money, right? You yes. try to lower your cost. Sure. What we all do. But these are risk-benefit analysis. You can save a lot of money on your premium. You can end up with what we like to call giraffe insurance. It covers giraffe stampedes on any day that doesn't end in a Y. Sure. So you're going to pay some a low premium, but you're going to get no protection. Uh, For example, the new legislation allows people with health insurance coverage of a certain quality to completely opt out of personal injury protection. An incredibly dangerous thing to do, but you'll save a lot of money. The the new legislation, if you keep what you have right now, will require a 10% reduction in the average PIP coverage. No one knows quite what that means, by the way. It's not your coverage. So whatever you're paying for your PIP, the $900, it's not a 10% reduction in that. It's a 10% reduction in the state average. 
it's it's very complicated. We wonder how they're really going to calculate this and who's going to keep everybody honest. But you'll get a 10% reduction of some from some number if you just keep what you have. If you go to the $500,000 coverage, you're going to um, – my memory is you're going to save uh, 20%. And if you go to the 250, you're going to save – 35 percent hmm. and that's in lieu of that that's number, in lieu of pip that's for pip remember you said this at the beginning you're absolutely right the vast majority of what you pay for in auto insurance is pip right so th- that's what matters now these reductions are only guaranteed to the year 2028 so it's only eight years uh, worth of protection, uh, reduction. Uh, I will tell you that almost every, not almost, every calculation that I've seen makes that a much better deal for the insurance company than it does for the individual who gets into an accident. And, you know, it, 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 if you don't, if you don't get into an accident, um, then you've wasted all of the I'm putting wasted in quotes. You can't see my air quotes. Sure. You've wasted all of your premium. You shouldn't have had to buy insurance at all. Right. right. But that's we buy insurance because people do get into accidents. Sure. Sure. And, and so, you, you know, you need to be very careful. I am very nervous about uh, I would I would caution anyone to be very careful about opting out of PIP benefits. You, 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 if you get into an accident, you are very likely, unless you're very wealthy and have lots of other coverage in, in other areas and will never lose your health insurance, you're very likely to regret that decision. Sure. So bottom, bottom in this entire conversation, if somebody only walks away with one thing is don't let that pip go away or don't, don't get, uh, enticed by the dark side that says you could save uh, 300 bucks. Remember you... that that the general rule that we learned back at Mad- in Madison Heights, you get what you pay for, right? Amen. And and if you and if you pay for zero, you're going to get zero. And the, you know, some of these options are going to be very appealing. Well, boy, you're going to save four hundred dollars every six months, eight hundred dollars a year. Jeez, you know, you know what I can do with eight hundred dollars? That's great. the The problem is, is that you're going to be you're going to end up on Medicaid. Most of us don't want to end up in Medicaid. On Medicaid, most of us don't want to end up in a state run facility because we don't have the insurance coverage to cover our needs. And, and that really becomes the issue. So my, my general recommendation is that if you're, going to, if you're going to come down from the uh, full benefits, if you want to save more than 10%, that you go with whatever you can afford. If you can afford the $500,000, you do that. And that you not go below the two hundred and fifty, you do not opt out. Sure, sure. Billy, thanks for taking a couple of minutes. And, I, and this doesn't... To me, close the discussion. It, it actually, I think, just opens the discussion. Um, and I, I, I just would caution everybody that's listening and uh, everybody we grew up with to um, don't take short money on the insurance policy. If I, if what I hear you say is correct, um, we could see our any any and all assets that we had just um, evaporate. If uh, somebody gets seriously, and it could be your spouse, it uh, uh, you know it could be somebody else. It could be. It's a, it's a great point, Mick. Remember, PIP benefits cover the people who are in your household. Right. So if if it's your wife, if your grandchild lives with you, if one of your kids live with you, a couple of your kids live with you. In this day and age, these kids never go away, right? Um, we couldn't wait to get out of our parents' house. We can't figure out a way to get our kids out of our house. But it covers everybody in the house. And I dare say that everyone I knew in Madison Heights when I was growing up, people I still know there, 
their kids or grandkids were in an accident, they'd spend every penny they had to take of care of them. Of course. Um, so. We always grow up thinking the worst thing that could happen is if something happened to me until we became a, <laughs> a, a spouse or a, especially a parent. Then yeah. you know that, no, the worst thing that could happen is if something happened to my kid or my right. wife or my husband. Right. Uh, and that's... Uh, that's stepping into a, a, a bigger reality. Hey, Billy, thank you. I, thank I just you hope so that much. we can I expand really this a little bit more. And um, let's see start what starts shaking out as, uh, uh, and we haven't even touched on the, why would the politicians do this to us? But then, hey, <laughs> hey. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we ought to stay away from political conversations in this day and age. Absolutely. But Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to try and answer the questions that I can. This was, this was a compromise. I mean, it, 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 this, this was a compromise. So we got some things out of it. We got eight years of some kind of reduction, even if we stay on the plan we have now. Right. We're going to get 10% of, of the average uh, PIP uh, benefits reduced. Uh, I'm sorry, premiums reduced. Right. So there, there are some benefits to what happened. There's some methods to control costs, which I'm not opposed to. The, the problem is that these got these costs got inflated because people on both sides were trying to make money. Healthcare providers were overcharging. Attorneys were taking advantage of the situation. There were problems of abuse on both sides. Insurance companies deny valid claims every day to try and force compromises uh, and settlements. And the other side created their, our own problems. So we, we got something and we gave some things up in this legislation. And we'll see what happens. Thanks for taking a couple of minutes, Billy. And let's see, uh, let's see what kind of questions we wind up with. Great. And, and if we can, to. yeah. And if we could touch you for some more time down the road uh, and expand on this, but uh, appreciate what you've done. I, I appreciate the time. Thanks, right, Mark. I'll talk to you soon. God bless. Bye-bye.